Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Session Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love group and is part of the Education in Love series. In the Facing My Fear of Emotion presentation, Jesus discusses the importance of dealing with false beliefs about emotion, having faith in God's truth about emotions, and the need to experience and release false emotional beliefs before change is possible. Recorded on the 9th of March 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Okay, how are you feeling this morning? Sort of a bit exhausted today, huh? Yeah. Mm. yeah. So why, why is that, do you think? <laughs> yeah, obviously when you resist emotions, that's what happens. So that's what happens to me too, exactly the same thing. So um, for myself though, it's more my throat, which basically says, I'm not sure if I want to talk to you today. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's a, obviously an issue of whether you want to hear today or not. And, um, and also, uh, like for most people, you know, we, once we get into some kind of emotional turmoil in terms of what we're going to choose to do, generally that's when the resistance to, resistances start poking up. And that's why both groups have found yesterday the hardest day. So, All right, well today we should be a bit easier. We've got a shorter day. Uh, the second day of the sessions are always shorter for that reason, just to help you gather your breath. But we're going to be discussing initially this, uh, this discussion, facing my fear of emotion. Then we'll be doing a Q&A about actions and emotions. And then we'll be getting into some group and, and personal feedback. And then we'll have a bit of a review of the session uh, before we break up at the end of the day. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about fear, shall we? Remember we raised some truths about fear yesterday, didn't we? Um, so what we want to do today is add a little bit more truths about fear to your repertoire so that you know what's going on with fear. Yeah. So can you remember what we covered yesterday about fear? Let's just see if we can remember where we're at there. Graham over here, thank you. And then on this side, if we come down to Jennifer on this side. Keep your hand up, Jenny, because John doesn't know you. Fear is a human emotion, a human constructed emotion. So it's a creation of humans. A creation of humans. Yeah, so we created, so humans created fear, which is interesting in itself, isn't it? Um, you know, from God's perspective, um, fear doesn't actually exist, interestingly enough. So God created the universe that you don't need to be afraid. You know, even if you die on this planet, well, immediately you're in another environment. It's not like you've really died. It's, that's wonderful in itself, isn't it? Like some accidental thing happens here on Earth and it's not like it's a permanent mistake and the rest of your life is now null and void or, or you know, that you have no more experience, isn't it? That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Yeah, so it's a human creation. What else did we learn? Can you remember? Jenna? Fear is a false emotion. It's a it's the fear of a fear of something happening. Right. So it's we a don't false think belief. We can cope with. Yeah. So it's a false belief. Yeah, and and right down at its core, every single fear is a false belief. Even all the fears that we have from past things that have happened to us are actually false beliefs, and and that's interesting in a sense, isn't it? Because most of us spend most of our life validating our fears. We spend most of our life living in our fears. We generally avoid anything to do with particularly emotional fear. And uh, it's a major problem that we face as humankind. And in fact, it's the major trigger for almost everything that's bad that happens on the earth. Fear is a primary trigger or is involved in the trigger including war, as we discussed yesterday. Anything else you remember? Uh, if we come across to, yeah, to Megan there, and then down to Katrina. That um, 
because it's something that humans created, then we have to destroy it. Yes, so so we need to we are the ones primarily responsible for destroying it. So since it's human creation, therefore w humans need to destroy it. Yeah. And how do we destroy it? It's Probably a couple of ways, isn't there? Um, sorry, I'm getting off the track for you, Katrina. What would you want to say first? I was just going to say that um, a lot of fear is manufactured. Right, so yes, very, very important. So it's manufactured. In other words, it's imaginary even because we've never had it. Remember we, yesterday we went through this thing of I asked you about who have you been bitten by a snake and nobody. <laughs> and then we said, well, who have you afraid of getting bitten by a snake? And most people <laughs> so that it just shows you how we can we can it's not actually manufactured by the actual event it's manufactured by other things yeah so my other question was um how do we go about destroying it what do we do if we come down to claudia here we educate ourselves in truth right so so truth is the antidote to fear but that's only one part of the equation that we introduced with you yesterday. The other part of the equation was the subject matter we were discussing, and that is action. So the way, the way to actually confront your fears is to take some action and then feel the truth about, feel the emotional truth about that particular action you've taken. So, so you, to confront fear, you actually need to embrace the qualities of faith, truth, action and emotion. So th these, uh, these four things are all intrinsically paired up really, aren't they? Now while you can develop some faith and do nothing else with truth, action or emotion, at the end of the day it's highly unlikely that faith is going to benefit you because you haven't acted on it. <laughs> Right, so, so it's highly unlikely it's going to benefit you. You can generate a desire for truth to a degree, but while you don't have any faith in it, you're highly likely you're not going to act on it. And if you're refusing to feel your emotion, then you're not going to really, it's going to be a thought only, not a feeling. So can you see all, all of these things are really, like they are coupled together. You, you, we need to see them all as a part of, if we're going to really want to progress, we're going to have to address these four areas of our life. Um, without a doubt, we're going to have to do that. All right. Um, a lot of us falsely believe that, tr that fear is under control, our control. From a false perspective, like, like we have a false belief that it's under our control. And the, way, the way we control it is that we basically manufacture our life so that any fear is not triggered. That's what we try to do. So we try to manufacture our life so that it turns out that every one of our fears is not, the button isn't pressed, the trigger isn't caused, and that causes us to believe a lot of the times that the fear doesn't even exist. And in the Western world, we have more, a higher capacity to do this than anywhere else in the world because we, we have the most amount of wealth and therefore the uh, biggest uh, amount of control of our environment through levels of comfort. So that's what we do. Uh, but the reality is, it's controlling us. So, so the real truth about fear is it controls us. If we let it, if we live in it, so stop believing that you've got your fear under control. The reality is it's got control of you. <laughs> and that is a bit of a good issue, isn't it, if you think about that. If fear has control of you, that means false beliefs have a control of you. Uh, and that means you're going to act in them, doesn't it, Graham? And if fear controls us, that means... It stops us doing lots of things we'd really like to do. Yes, the, re the real self, the personality that's buried underneath all that facade and all that hurt, um, would really like to be doing some things, but the facade is going, I'm going to look after the hurt child that's got this fear, 
And so I'm going to do a whole heap of other things to prevent the fear from happening. And so the real self doesn't get to be expressed. And this is frequently what's happening in your life too. You, the, the real self, the real person you really are, is rarely out there on display. It's mostly covered over. Mostly it's unexpressed. And this becomes a problem with developing your loving self, like your, your real self. Yes, so that's a bit of an issue, isn't it? If we go right up the back. Yes. Yeah, um, I find that I have... Oh, yeah. Need to stand up there, so... Um, I find that I have a fear um, that's of probably covering over other things, but... And I hide myself away, like you said. I'm not myself. And I do that even though the reasons for that fear are now much less or don't even exist anymore. Well, yeah, you might think that, but the reality is if they're within us, from our perspective, they exist still. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's our problem, isn't it? Yeah. While they remain in us, it can be events that happened years ago. And to be frank with you, it can be events that happened centuries ago. <laughs> you know, that, that other people were afraid of and that fear entered you through the process of, you know, giving, you know, conception, birth and so forth over the generations and now it's still within you. So, so some of you are children, for example, of parents who lived in the Second World War, right? So, you know, you're afraid of the violence that they experienced, but, but you didn't experience it. But now that fear is inside of you. So, so the key is, while you carry it around inside of you, it's real to you. And the only way it can stop becoming real to you is for you to stop carrying it around inside of you. That's the only way. So, so the only way that can happen is by experiencing it. There's no other way. It has to be experienced. So most of us avoid the experience and so we finish up carrying it around inside of us. Then it controls us. And in fact, we need to come to see actually in this process that for the majority of us, fear is God. It's the only desire we actually express. It's the only passion we actually express, the desire or passion to avoid what we're afraid of. And, and for most of us, our entire life is lived like that. Right? Constantly avoiding, constantly avoiding the feeling of fear and doing everything we can, every Every choice we make, every decision we make. We, we'll even get married. We'll have children because of it. We'll get married. We, we'll, you know, sue people because of it. We'll go to war for it. That's how bad the situation is for the, for the majority of the planet. Right? And while this fear remains, kind of fear remains within us, it obviously is having a very negative effect and a very negative impact upon our lives. Right? Now what we want to do is look at the issue with regard to emotion. So let's remember those particular things we talked about with fear and let's just summarise it as basically fear has become the only thing we desire. It is our passion. It is, a, it is God. It is our passion in a sense. It rules our life and we don't even believe it does. That's how bad it is. <laughs> We're in this total state often of this complete personal delusion so most of us are basically bat crazy we are thinking that our fear is real actually makes us from god's perspective quite crazy and nutters right? <laughs> because we do a whole heap of things that are so illogical like going to war is a very illogical way to address your fear but we've done that for millennia. We have. Marrying someone because they'll provide you with safety and security is the worst possible thing you could do for your own happiness. But we do it all the time. In fact, the majority of us in our life have done it. Uh, so, you know, this is an example of where we're just, like I said, we're just nuts. 
We've just gone nuts. We've gone nuts on making fear our God. Yeah. Thanks, Tara. So um, the world pretty much believes that we were given fear for the you know fight, flight, freeze response as well. You know, back when we were cavemen and running from the tiger, the fear. So, um, so God didn't give us that, obviously. But but you know, the safety thing, like that's so. If fear of our safety is still yeah. Now we're what you're die. doing is you're confusing the animal with the soul. Right. Do you understand? Like, uh, let me explain what I mean by that. This is you, one half of a soul, right? And you have two bodies. One is a spiritual body and one is a physical body, right? And this is your soul, or you, one half of your soul, because you remember you've got a soul mate. Okay. Now, now God created, directly created what? This, did he not? This was directly created by God. Right? Who knows how the other things came into being, but for the majority of us, how they came into being was conception. Um, not, so rather than chasing it right back to the beginning, let's look at what's happening now. Conception. So you could say these two bodies were created through the conception process. Okay? So conception. And this particular body, this one, is the one that we can, we can see. That's the thing we see with our eyes, right? So that's the thing we think we are. So the majority of you believe you're the body you are, in the body you are. But the reality is, you, your soul exists without that body. Your soul can exist without that body. And your soul can actually exist without a spirit body too, as one, once it gets into a union condition with the other half. It can exist without a spirit body too. So both bodies are basically immaterial to your long-term existence if you continue to progress God's way. But this, is, this body is the thing we see. And this body has a whole lot of what I would classify as appetites. Passions. Desires. That are driven by necessity. In other words, if you think about eating, well, obviously, that's something that's driven by the appetite of the physical body. The physical body, the brain, sends an alarm to, to yourself saying that actually we need sustenance now. And the same applies to water, thirst and so forth, right? So there's a whole lot of what I would classify as physiological responses needed to sustain the physical body, including the effluent system of our physical body. That's all part and parcel of that, right? Okay. And what we often do is we then allow these appetites, passions and desires of the physical body to dominate how the soul acts. Do you follow? I think so. Right, so what we do is we say, right, the physical body needs sex. So that means I'm going to go and muck around with any woman that comes along. It doesn't, re it doesn't really matter. The physical body needs to be safe. So what I'm going to do is make sure the physical body remains safe. None of that is actually true, the way God's created it. Your soul is safe no matter whether your physical body disappears or not. Yeah. So it's not really true. It's just that we've come to believe it's true because we've also separated ourselves from God, and from therefore from God's education, therefore from God's truth, yeah. and so forth. So it's our physical body that we're afraid of losing. It is. Yeah. Ironically, it's not even our soul that we're afraid of losing. It's our physical body because we think our physical body is our soul. Right? The instant you pass, or shortly thereafter, you'll realise that your physical body wasn't your soul. And so you know what you'll then assume, like most do, that their spirit body is their soul. And then they live that same way they used to live, right, within their physical body, connecting to their spirit body. But that's also not your soul from God's perspective. And once you understand the truth of that, you don't allow the soul to be driven by the appetites of the bodies. Yeah. The soul becomes the part of you that drives your attitudes and behaviours, not your bodies. So, for example, if you had the choice of you know, killing somebody else and eating them, 
in order to survive, the soul would scream at you about that particular problem if you were in a harmony with love. And so you wouldn't do it even if you're going to die as a result of it. But historically, most people are body centric. And so like in, shortly after my death in the first century, the Roman army encamped uh, Jerusalem and did it, laid a siege to Jerusalem for four years. There was no food going in and out or anything. And in the end, the mothers were having children just to eat them. That's what was happening. That was so fear was driving them so much to survive that that's what they did. It's shocking, isn't it? But that's an illustration of how the physical body, you know, when we allow its appetites and desires and passions, it, it drives what happens to our soul then. And this is our problem is that, is that because we don't know the truth, so this is an issue of truth. We then become physical body centric. And then, of course, all of the physical body maintenance issues are all now supreme in our mind. And they become the driving factor of our life. Right? Which is a big problem in, in terms of the exercise of the loving will of our soul. Because now what we've got is our physical bodies, appetites, passions and desires driving our soul rather than our soul choosing love. And to act in harmony with love, our soul is now being f like the, the, the mind is choosing things for the soul instead. Can you see that's a, a big problem? And historically, there's been many very, very shocking things happen as a result of that. Yep. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So I see this mistake frequently made where people are allowing. And, and it happens in the spirit world too, where they're actually allowing the spirit body's mind to drive the spirit survival of the spirit body, spirit body's mind driving the actual process of the soul rather than the soul having the power to, to control everything. Right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a big issue in terms of our conception. Our, when I say not, not the conception of our, ourselves as, as bodies, but the, the conception, the, the way that we interpret information in our mind is driven by these passions and desires rather... And if we could feel our soul, we wouldn't do that. We, we would do something completely different. Amber? Um, what would be the loving way to address someone who is trying to physically harm you, for example, rape you, or physically kill you, what would be the loving thing to do in that scenario? Well, if you look at my life in the first century, I think I demonstrated what's the loving thing to do. Just let it happen. Yeah, what else can you do? That doesn't seem loving at all because if you had self-love, you'd take action and... Yeah, but if you, if you try, if you're, just, if you're saying no and you don't want it emotionally, like if it's a rape, what else can you actually do? without killing the person well my first instinct would be to fight back or stab them or you know yeah protect kill myself. them yeah. Yeah. Or, or to prevent them yeah that's and this is where most of you have the world's view of that but does it is it working like i don't know if it is working you know in the usa the majority of women who are raped are raped at gunpoint and the majority of the guns came from them isn't that interesting? 90, I think it's something like 90% of the time the gun came from the woman themselves. Carrying the gun with her. She's carrying the gun because she's afraid of rape, right? And, and a guy comes along, he hasn't got a gun, she pulls out the gun, he takes the gun off of her. And then, so it, it's an interesting statistic in itself. It, it demonstrates what, I, what I'm saying to you. If a, if a person, if you're saying no, and the person still wants to go ahead and do something, there's little you can do to stop them unless you're prepared to be violent, right? Or restraining, I would find well, restra restraint. Yeah, if it's possible to restrain them, but it's pretty hard for a woman to restrain a person who's stronger than herself. Is it not? Yeah, it is. Mm. Felix, this is where, where you get into rebellion. and you, Can you feel your rebellion straight away? It's just like, yeah, you, you, want, you want the world's view. And you want the world's view on so many things. 
that it's impossible for God to share with you God's view. Like I've seen these arguments all the time come up over and over again. You want the world's view, you want to be able to choose the world's view and these are the things you're going to have to confront inside of yourself emotionally if you ever want to be in harmony with God. Felix? I mean, uh, <clears throat> with, with, a, with like physical attack, mm -hmm. as was, um, uh, Emma mentioned, I mean, if you can't run away, mm -hmm. they, they, you can't uh, talk them out of it, they can't run away. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, using some physical force that doesn't do permanent damage would still, like, would maybe... Yeah, or just, just like a, you know, an L on the stomach and then you run or something. <laughs> that, that, that would still be, be loving. Did I do that in the first century, Felix? So I suppose you didn't. Okay. <laughs> you, you, you're skipping over the issues, guys, you know, because you don't want to receive the truth from God about it. And there's nothing I can do about it for you. You, you want to believe what you want to believe, and while you want to do that, you're going to keep doing it. And while you keep doing it, you're going to be removed from God, if that's what you want to do. That's up to you. I'm just telling you what God's perspective is. That's all. Yeah, if we go straight behind, Felix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if we if you were, hold it closer, closer. If we were um, living to God's laws, yeah, closer, have, please. We Can't wouldn't you? have the fear. Yep. In us, that would attract those situations that we would need to. Well, that that is partially true. Other people in the world still have choice, as we pointed out yesterday, so they could still choose to harm you. Like in the first century, I wasn't afraid of my death, but, but people still chose to crucify me. Does that make sense? Mm. So, so just because you don't have fear is no guarantee that somebody won't choose through their own exercise of their own yeah. free will to harm you. Mm. But does lessen the yes, possibility of greatly, it happening. Greatly, yes, right. of course. Yeah, yep. of course it does. Uh, if we go to Paul. Uh, did you say in the first century uh, if someone strikes you on the cheek to turn the other? Yeah, I did. And, and is that what you meant? Lot, like, uh, Well, if you're in a situation where you, where you can't get away from the person what else are you going to do? You, you're only, the only choice is either to remain peaceful or to become violent. That's the only choice that's in front of you. Now, a person who loves chooses to remain peaceful, don't they? Rather than to become violent. That's what a person who loves would do, wouldn't they? So that's why you do it. And like I said, you're not addicted to the outcome because you know... That you're soul centric, you know that like if they kill you, what what's changed? You've still got life. You still got in fact you've got more flexibility in the spirit state than you do here on earth, so you've even got a better life. Like so I I, I don't see why see it's only because we are physical body centric, as I pointed out in the previous illustration that you have all of these injuries that you want to then engage through violence in order to protect your physical body and uh, thinking that that's the worst possible thing that can happen to you. Now, now, both myself and Mary in the first century were abused sexually. Both of us were, both Mary and myself were tortured, both of us, upon death and also at other times. And both of us did exactly the same thing. Right? Both of us did exactly the same thing. We responded peacefully. Right? But you guys don't like that idea. And I get, I get why you don't. And the re main reason why is because you're physical body centric. That's the main reason why. And if you, had a, if you felt differently, you would f feel that it, God's truth would be better. Does that make sense? So Alex? Uh, I just wanted to say, just just recently, Monique and I started feeling our fears, and there was a three-day period where we were just in fear after fear after fear, and we noticed that it was the only time that we can remember that we didn't get a single mozzie bite, <laughs> a single ant bite, yeah, ugh, flies. It was it was so peaceful. The effect of it, yeah, was just amazing. 
Yeah, we don't realise how many negative events happen yeah. in our life as a result of our fear, which is the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Just, can I just say, well, just one other thing was, mm-hmm. I've had this come up really strongly about the physical body, and um, but I'm kind of a little bit open to truth about it. And yep. we were just hugging the other night, and it just felt absolutely useless. <laughs> yeah. Because it was the first time I realised... There's no feeling coming out of me toward her. Yeah. And no feeling coming out of her toward me. Exactly. It was just shit. Yeah. It was just like nothing. Like I was just like clapping my hands. Like. Yeah. It feels very unfulfilling. Yeah. And unsatisfactory. Yeah, totally. I agree. Yeah. 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 Um, Graham, thank you. Um, in that situation where somebody wants to do you harm, mm-hmm. um, would a really loving person, you know, knowing that they can't escape, um, behave in a way that gives the attacker the greatest opportunity to feel what they're doing? Of course. But that's not always possible either, given the fact that most people who are reverting to attack are already quite desensitised from their own emotional condition. Otherwise, they wouldn't attack you. Yes, but maybe some years down the track they might remember the experience. Of course. Most of the people, including Cornelius, that were involved in my death have responded to God's truth at some point. So that would be the... the turning the other cheek gives them that experience. Yeah, it gives them the... Opportunity. An opportunity. You're giving them opportunity. And because you love people, that's what you do. You give them an opportunity to be different. Uh, But you also know that whatever happens to the physical body, once you've disconnected your worth from your physical body, you know that whatever happens to the physical body isn't affecting your soul. You can you can actually prevent the flow of thing of information from your physical body to your soul, even under those circumstances. If you have that level of control over your bodies through your soul, you can actually prevent the flow of certain feelings from your physical body to your soul. So. So in other words, you can, you can be stabbed and not actually feel the pain of the stab even by controlling your physical body from your soul. And that's not an avoidance? No, it's just a ma- your physical body, because you're now soul-centric, you're now so- everything's controlled by your soul, you're able to control the responses of both of your bodies. Right? So you're able to slow down your respiratory system, you're able to slow down your heart, you're able to control how the brain works and you're able to control the recovery process of the actual body itself. You can heal it rapidly. In, in fact, you can heal it instantly if you're connected with God. So, so, so there were th- two or three occasions before I died where I was stabbed before, you know, because there were people trying to kill me before my crucifixion. And, and I got stabbed on a number of occasions. One time I got stabbed very close to my heart um, and managed to heal it before I passed. Does that make sense? So these are things you can do when you're in the state of you know, soul-centric, understanding the power of your soul and in that one moment with God. These are the things you can do. And, and many of your questions like collectively many of your questions about violence and how to handle violence and all these other things are really questions that boil down to the fact that you still think your physical body is the central part of you does that make sense because if you didn't think that then then you would behavior would quite significantly change under many circumstances Mm. yeah if we come down to dennis So, as a, as a fact, if we didn't retaliate, we'd be closer to God anyway if we died. Of course. And in fact, uh, many people have in that instant become closer to God by, by having a peaceful response to violence. And before then, they may not have even, but they decided to have a peaceful response. And in that process, they grew and as a result, arrived in the spirit world in a better condition just of because of that one event. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So can you see how, can you see one of the reasons why we're so afraid of emotion? Because a lot of it is associated with the fact that we're physical body centric and, and we feel all these things might happen to our physical body. 
And, and many of you are so afraid of emotion in that you think you're going to die if you feel emotion. You do. You have this belief that's really, really strong inside of you that if you feel emotion to the extent that you're going to need to feel it from God's perspective, you, you'll die through the process, right? So you have a lot of false beliefs about emotion. But that's not the only problem. So let's just write that down first. We have these false beliefs about emotion that, that determine why we don't want to feel emotion and then determine many of our actions that become unloving so in other words we're using then our will to avoid how we're going to feel and in the process we choose to use our will in an unloving and untruthful manner so that we can avoid feelings or even avoid other people feeling we often do that too so how many times have you heard somebody cheats on somebody else and then they say I never told them because it would hurt them well, no, cheating on them hurt them, is my feeling. <laughs> and, you, you know, they have the right to know that it happened and they also have the right to make a decision after that. But, but telling them the truth is not what's going to hurt them. If you didn't cheat on them, if you told them the truth, you'd, you'd say, well, I haven't cheated on you, nothing's happened. So, <laughs> so it, wouldn't it be better if nothing happened? Of course it would. Right. So, so we often justify unloving behavior by also justifying further unloving behavior to support the unloving behavior and we do that because we don't want to feel emotion we do that because we're afraid of emotion so facing my fear of emotion is going to be a key part of my progression i'm going to have to allow my emotion to flow i'm going to have to allow myself to feel what's really going on inside of me before I can change. I'm going to have to. But most of us don't want to. So what, what we do it, when we don't want to is remarkable because we manufacture a whole set of false beliefs to prevent ourselves from feeling emotion. And then we go even one step further than that. We also manufacture false emotions in order to prevent the real emotions. Oh, that's pretty s sneaky, isn't it? <laughs> right? So, and I see many of you doing that all the time. In fact, remember my conversation, I think it was with you, Natalie, I don't know if it was yesterday or a couple of days ago now, but remember I had the conversation where you were just manufacturing some emotion you 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 believed you knew what the emotion was and i said there's nothing to do with that it's to do with sort of the feeling that you're superior to men instead of that well, this is an example of where you know we manufacture emotion because it's more pleasant if that could be said more pleasant to feel the manufactured emotion than it is to feel the real one and this is what we do with God as well. Like we blame God for a whole heap of things because we'd prefer to have the emotion with God than have to work through the emotion with our childhood events. We do the same thing. It's just all, a lot of it's manufactured. It's choice that we're making. We, we actually don't realize that a lot of the things that we think we're going to have to feel, we're not going to have to feel at all. And a lot of the things we've got no clue or, or no idea about whatsoever we're going to have to feel, right? And, and the key is to find out which one's real, but you're not going to get to find out which one's real and which one's not if you're already choosing which one to feel. So this is how we choose. Our choice is quite simple when it comes to emotion. This is how we choose. We have an emotion, and then we refer it to our mind, so that it can decide which one is pleasant and which one is painful. Then the mind makes a choice. We, we make the, at the soul level, we're making this choice. Painful emotions are a no-no. They're, they're not like, no, you can't feel those, you, you have to prevent those. So then we refer the painful emotion back to the soul and the soul says, so our soul's driving our emotions, right? And our soul says, right, it's a painful emotion, I'm not going to feel it. It creates emotion, I'm not going to feel it. It tells the mind, I don't want to feel it. 
And so what does the mind do? Construct a whole heap of belief systems to support the fact that the soul doesn't want to feel this emotion. That's what it does. Right? Now that's one method, but there's another method, and that is the mind sees it's a painful emotion and goes, I want to tell myself that I'm processing emotion, and many of you have fallen into this trap. You've heard me talk about emotions for years, right? So, so what you're doing is you're going, okay, AJ's saying to me that I've got to feel emotion in order to progress. But there's a whole heap of emotions I don't want to feel. But I need to feel that I'm progressing. So what it's better that I do is I, if I see the real emotion, it's better to me than to create a fictitious emotion, right, a fiction, emotionally, and choose to feel that. Now my soul will let me do that because that's not the real emotion. Right? And it makes me feel like I'm progressing. Isn't that wonderful? I get to feel like I'm progressing and I, and I process the emotion. I might even cry for a few days or whatever and process the emotion. Right? And I go and I come out at the end, oh, I feel much better now. I've processed the emotion and it's all crap. You haven't changed. Your life hasn't changed. You haven't changed in your attitude with people. You haven't changed in the, in the way that you love. You haven't changed in all of these things. But you're not interested in measuring that. Because you've just convinced yourself that you've processed an emotion that was real. And you prefer to do that than process the real emotion, which is actually more painful, and you don't want to experience it. That's pretty slippery, eh? And many of you have done that. I've observed many of you ladies and men doing that. So that's a very slippery thing to do. You want things? Um, could you maybe give an example of this? Yeah, here's a here's real easy example. So, like, oh, I think we've already given though plenty already in this program, but, but here's an example. Like, you've got a very painful emotion, for example, with your mother on earth. She's still alive and you still have a relationship with her, right? And it's a very painful emotion that exists in a soul. It gets triggered by some other woman. You know, you're in a relationship with another woman, it gets triggered. Right? So what do you do? You have a big down and out fight with the other woman. Right? So you have all this anger and rage come up and it's all directed at this other woman. But, but she didn't cause it. She didn't cause this emotion. Your mother did. And, and you don't want to have a fight with your mother. You don't want to go through the process of even feeling like you can't spend any time with your mother because you, you're still needy for all of her approval and acceptance so that you can feel like you've got some worth because you're worse tied into her but you're worse not tied into this other woman so you can dump the whole cra load of crap on her on your partner or you know just it might be a beginning relationship or whatever you can dump a whole load of crap on her in order to avoid the painful emotion you have with your mother and then not only that we, we even go worse than that we go home to mummy when the, re when the relationship breaks up and tell her how much of a bitch that other woman was Right? When actually it was the mother who created the problem. And we're unwilling to feel it. Like, isn't that really clever? <laughs> it's clever, a way of avoiding our emotion, you see. Right? We still want to maintain that other relationship. It supplies our worth. It supplies a lot of our addictions. We still want that maintain, maintain. And so when the other woman comes along, of course, she receives all the crap from it until such a point in time that she decides that she no longer wants to receive all the crap from it and leaves us. And then when she does leave us, we go home to mummy and tell mummy that, all, that she was really bad. Wasn't it terrible what, what I attracted? No, I, you know, we don't even see it like that. We do this all the time, Bjorn all the time if you think about our relationships and our friendships and our the way in which we act with people just you know we do it all the time yeah just pass the mic next to go yeah so aj what you're saying is that's the fictitious that's the fiction that we've created that relationship well the fiction we've created is that the lady in question who i've got the relationship with in the example i've given mm. is actually the cause of the painful emotion when she's not Mm. I attracted her into my life to trigger the painful emotion, but the painful emotion is actually with my mother, and I don't want to feel that. Mm. That's the real emotion. Yeah. So I choose the painful one. So if we're doing some soul work, we might try and 
address the the new lady in in the well emotions. i see many of you in relationships doing this where you're trying to address your partner for things which your partner either has been attracted to you to trigger or who that does not even do what you're accusing him or her of doing mm. and instead it's your mother and father who have done it and you're unwilling to feel that more painful emotion right so because because you view relationships with people you know sexual relationships with people as passing tra and transient that's one of the reasons why we do it you, you you want to view your family relationships as living as being forever and you want to view your you know sexual relationships as passing and transient and the, and, and it doesn't matter if they've been married for 30 years you're still you're still more many are still more connected to their mummies and daddies than they are to their partner Right? And that's because they've not dealt with these painful emotions associated with their mummy and daddies, right? Which they then put on the partner. Now, if the partner's r really nice, is the way we see it, but, but actually it's not really loving from God's perspective, but from our perspective, world's view of love, if the partner's really nice, he'll meet all of my addictions that mummy or daddy created. Uh, and then we call him nice or call her nice. From God's perspective, she's not being nice, or he's not being nice because they're feeding your addictions. And that's never nice. It's always going to result in pain down the track, right? But, but we don't want to examine all of that because we're so convinced that our view of love is right. We're so convinced that we've got no problems with our family of origin. And we're so convinced that the person we've attracted, which, which we've attracted due to soul conditions within ourselves, which we also deny, we're so convinced that it's their fault that we're willing to have fights and arguments with them rather than address the issue that's really going on. Yeah. yeah. Slippery, eh? Hey? See why we probably shouldn't be called humans and should be called eels? But that's probably bad for the eel. Can't call it a weasel, can't call it an eel. I don't know what we're going to be left with after that. <laughs> yeah. We, we do a lot of manipulative things, but what I'm getting at is that we have this choosing thing going on. We, we believe, many of you falsely believe, that your mind is capable of choosing the pleasant emotion and rejecting the unpleasant or painful emotion and surviving the choice. That's what you believe. And I'm saying, no, you're not surviving the choice here. What you're doing is you're storing up painful emotion after painful emotion. And unfortunately, that's like a feedback system to the soul. The more the painful emotion gets stored in the soul, the more it drives the next emotion and the next decision. And so you end up with this escalating issue where you, you do one unloving thing. It has a compounding effect because we no, don't choose to feel the pain and we do another unloving thing. It has another compounding effect because we don't feel the pain of that. It, we choose to do another unloving thing. Now our unloving life is adding up and the results of that life, if you're not feeling it already through pain and suffering on the planet, you are definitely going to feel it after you pass. Right? And, and, and we need to stop that process. And the only way to stop that process is to change our fear of overwhelming emotions that we believe are pain. Right? And I, I even think like nowadays that, wow, we even see them as pain, but the reality is, to me, they're not pain. To me, pain is when you avoid them. So you, even after you felt, when you start feeling a lot of these emotions, you'll actually get to the point where you don't actually see emotions as pain. You see not feeling them as pain. That's the creation of pain. That's what you finish up feeling. And so, so for myself now, and Mary's getting to this point nearly too, where it's just like, um, I just feel like if I'm not connecting... Right, I find it painful. Connecting is like a relief. It's like oh, a last bit of myself coming back, you know. And if I'm not connecting for a period of time, it feels absolutely terrible. Terrible nowadays. Right. Yeah. So if we go across to Pamela. Yeah, that's exactly what happened to me. I found I came here because I was in a crisis point. 
I couldn't continue. Um, and I'm really excited about yesterday because um, I really felt a little bit of that what you said about the truth will set you free. Mm. Now, a few days ago when you said confusion, because I know I've got to feel my anger and I can't understand why I can't, they, confusion goes over anger. So I just made the decision, I'm not going to be confused anymore, whatever. Mind, just disconnect, you know, just uh, let it rest for a while. Mm -hmm. So I even crossed out my question, question. I asked yep. you. And I just sat with it. And yesterday, you told me the truth. Since I was about three or four, I've had this terror of spiders. And I know it was because it was my father was there. Mm. And and I, at the, when I found out it wasn't really... I've been trying to process this spider thing. Absolute terror. Screaming, panic. Yep. Help me, God. I don't want to live if I have to live with this fear. Yeah. And I knew I was living in fear and it just wasn't... Going anywhere. It wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. And when you said yesterday that the spider really represents um, that... Um, uh, my father, father withdrawing he, love. Yeah. was my love. Hmm. God, that was such a relief. And I went home and I, I felt very... Um, Yesterday, you were. Uh, we went. Feel just. Um, I felt very light and um, disconnected yep. in a way because it was my mind that I was. Um, Pamela, you know what you're doing now, though. No, I'm story. You're storytelling yeah. with me. Okay. Which is demonstrating oh, an addiction, sorry. isn't yes. it? Yes. Yes. So you, I'm, I'm, did I'm you have really a question? That, yes. Um, <laughs> so uh, so that yes, I'd had that question that um, so that the, what I was feeling before that terror wasn't a real um, emotion or did it prepare me to sort of now feel uh, able to um, feel the, the yeah. real underneath thing? Well, um, <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of addiction you're projecting here in this okay. particular conversation, yep. which is wanting my approval. Remember I had a conversation, and it might not have been with this group actually, it might have been last week, but I, I get my groups mixed up sometimes, but um, where, uh, like, um, I'm just trying to think who it was. With. No, it was the last week, that's right, I was listening to it this morning actually. Um, yeah, the, you, what you're doing is projecting approval at me. Now if I said to you, no, mm. um, you know, it wasn't, or I said to you, yes, it was, you would modify your opinion based on my approval. Hmm. Would you not? Um, yes, uh, yeah, I suppose you, I would. You but would, I, I because you have this issue with your dad, you see, which hmm. ironically is about the spider as well. But, <laughs> but, um, but you would do that. And that tells me that you're prepared to give your will up to me. Hmm rather than to trust your own experience. Now, your own experience is telling you, firstly, you did all this, you know, processing about spiders, which didn't do anything for you. <laughs> Agreed? Yeah. So that tells me that it doesn't do anything for you. Mm -hmm. You did a bit of processing about the relationship with your dad related to the spider, and it does something for you. Yeah. So that tells me the truth that actually it's exactly what I said it was, and that's yeah. related to that. Mm. You don't need my approval no. to understand mm. both of those decisions that you've made. What you need to do is go back and analyse your experience mm. and tell yourself the truth about it. Mm. By, by trying to get my approval, what you're doing is you're putting your will in my hands. Okay. And many of you have done this with me in the past mm. and you, 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 you're desperate for a cult leader. Desperate, mm. many of you. right? And it's really wrong. You, you need to stop being desperate for somebody to give you approval or acceptance, mm -hmm. which is addiction, mm. in, in order to validate your experience. You need to be honest about your own experience. I don't need you to validate my experience. In fact, the majority of you don't value, val validate my experience. You oppose it. Right? So, so if I listened to you, I would have denied I was Jesus 10 years ago. Right? Because all of you pretty much when you met me projected at me that I'm not. So 
I would have denied that 10 years ago if I hooked into what your approval is telling me. And what I'm saying to you is that if you keep doing this, you're giving away the responsibility for your own will to be exercised, which is a, which is a major problem. Does that make sense? So, yes. And this is what you're doing with men. Okay. Does it make sense? So, so yeah, the same thing happened in the last group with another person. I think, uh, I think it was Zoe, Ben, wasn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. And Ben's, Ben's wife did it last, last week. Uh, where she told a story, <laughs> basically the same as yourself, and then uh, and then asked for my approval of the story, which I didn't give her for the same reason I can't give you yours. I think it's very important that you all realise the necessity to be completely responsible for the analysis of your own progression. Because you're the one who's living with you 24 by 7, nobody else is, right? You're the one, between you and God, you should be able to sort out your progression. And what I'm trying to teach you to do is to avoid all of the reasons why you don't do that, so that, that's, a, that's a way I'm trying to influence you. But I certainly don't want to you know, have to feed your addictions. If I was a feeding addictions kind of guy, it's highly likely that we'd have 20,000 people at presentations, right? given the fact that I've been now speaking what, for 11 years or whatever, and given the fact that everyone would be wrapped in the way that I could feed their addictions because I'm pretty sensitive emotionally and I'd probably be able to feed most of your addictions pretty well if I chose that, right? But it's not the way forward with your relationship with God. And so therefore it's something I cannot do, right? And something you cannot do is give away your will. Many of you are doing it. But if you keep doing it, you're going to find you're not going to progress. Many of you are doing this with spirits around you, just giving up your will, giving up your will, giving up your will. They just make a little suggestion in your mind and you're not focused on what's loving and truthful. You're focused on whatever is pleasurable or painful. And they're two separate decisions that need to be made here. If you keep focusing on what's painful as avoidance and only trying to do what you currently believe is pleasant, which by the way is the world's definition of pleasant, which is usually resulting in more pain for your soul, but you think it's pleasant. If you keep getting influenced in this way by people around you who are on earth and people who are in the spirit world, your only course is to be further destroyed in your soul through those actions and therefore have more pain and suffering in your life. That's the only result. So we've got to learn to have a very strongly developed sense of will, strongly developed sense of ourselves, strongly developed sense of will, so that we are not easily manipulated or convinced, but evidence, logical and emotional, presented to us, we're open to receiving, but we analyse it and we consider it. Does that make sense? That's what we need to do. Yeah. Emma, thank you. Amber, can I just point out to you that while you keep your hand up like that, uh, while I'm speaking to another person, and many of you do this as well, what you're really doing is you're ignoring what I'm saying because you're so focused on what you want to say. Now, like I feel that that often is happening with many of you asking questions. You've got your hand up like you want to get your point across, but the reality is you're not listening to the point I'm making. Often that point I'm making applies to you and you're completely dismissing it. Do you follow? So my suggestion is when I am speaking about a subject that's quite important, like that issue of will I was just talking about with, with uh, Pamela, the the thing to do is to let that truth sink into your heart you're here in the presentation in the so there's attraction let it sink into your heart and then if that discussion triggers a question put up your hand after that does that make sense but fire away <laughs> i'm a bit frightened to now <laughs> yeah um. yeah daddy told you off that's another addiction go on <laughs> <laughs> well um I was just curious about the reason that we are so open to hand our will over to others and spirits um, is that we have very, very little trust in ourselves. Can you see that your question, you're asking it because you didn't actually hear my answer to Pamela because in the answer to Pamela, I actually told her the reason why it happens. Shall I say it again? 
You don't have to. <laughs> oh, I will say it again because this is very important <laughs> to understand. We are trying to choose pain for, uh, pe pleasure over pain. That is our only motivation. So, so what's happening inside of us is we're not interested and in love and truth compared with error. So in our mind and in our soul, we're not comparing love and truth with error and then making a decision. What we're doing is we're comparing what we believe is pleasure and pain and making a decision. So the reason why we allow people of all sorts, spirits and others, to influence our unloving decisions is because inside of us we do not have any developed sense of what is loving versus what is unloving. What we only have as a measuring stick, and this is the measuring stick most of the planet use, is whether it's pleasant or painful. That's the only measuring stick we use to make our decisions. If it's pleasurable, do it. If it's painful, don't do it. Now, each one of you has a different definition. Remember, there's six and seven billion different definitions of what is love and what isn't. So each of you has a different definition of what is pleasure and what is pain. Some of you think having sex all the time is pleasure. Others of you couldn't think of anything worse. Right? You'd view that as pain. So, so our internal systems are measuring what, from, what, from our own injuries and from our own hurt and so forth, what we believe is pleasant and painful. But basically what we're doing is what we believe is painful, we avoid, and what we believe is pleasurable, we do, and that's the only decision we're making. We're not making a decision based on what is loving and truthful versus what is error and unloving. We're not making that decision. In fact, that decision doesn't even cross our mind a lot of the time. We're just in this other decision instantly. Right? Now, I could give many millions of examples of that, you know, and where you see that happening all the time in each of your lives. And the key for you to do is to change that, this pain versus pleasure way of addressing your life. So in other words, stop using even your mind to make a distinction between what is pleasurable and what is painful and start using your soul and your mind to make a distinction about what is loving and truthful versus what is error and unloving. Start doing that. Does that make sense? Now that can be done at your will, but remember what we're talking about in this two days is there's a whole heap of things that stop you from doing that with your will. They are your desire to resist faith, your desire to resist truth, your desire to, your, your fear of action and your fear of emotion. They stop you from doing that. You follow? So what you do then is you don't make this decision here with your heart or your mind. So let's say our mind and our heart can be our soul and our mind can be involved in this decision. Right? But what we do is over here, our mind and our soul is involved only in this decision. Now, it's very important you get that. Very important that you get that actually what you're doing with most of your life is just making a decision based on what is pleasurable and painful. And, and it's your definition of what's pleasurable and painful. And that's why you will make a completely different decision than someone else in exactly the same situation because inside of you, you have a predispos predispositions towards what is pleasurable and what is painful. Like for some of you, what is pleasurable is eating until you're stuffed full, right? That's pleasurable, right? Now, of course, those kind of people generally get bigger and bigger and bigger, do they not? Right? That's what they believe is pleasure. But when they have a heart attack, it's, that's the results of that action. They then work out, well, maybe there's some pain associated with it, right? For many people on earth believe smoking is pleasurable. But when they get lung cancer from it, then it wasn't so pleasurable, right? But me interestingly enough, many people continue to smoke even after they have lung cancer. So they don't even... To them, the pleasure of getting the lung of, of the smoking is not worth 
the pain of dying to avoid. And th this shows you how skewed we are in our own personal measure of what is pleasurable and what is painful. And we need to understand that. Now, to, not tomorrow, but the next day, we'll be having a talk about pain and pleasure for this reason. But what I'm getting at here in terms of talking about our fear of emotion is that we need to understand that for the majority of us, we just view all emotion that is painful must be avoided. And it's our definition of painful. Uh, some, what, some emotions that you think are terrible to feel, other people think is great to feel. Right? But, so it's our personal definition of what is painful that determines how, how much we're willing to experience our emotion. Isn't that like, pretty full on when you think about it? Because basically what we're saying is, I'm in a condition of sin where I want to sin. I'm in a condition where most of the beliefs that I have are actually completely out of harmony with love and truth. And the only way that I measure my behaviour is not looking at love and truth at all, not looking at truth and error at all. I'm not comparing. What I'm doing is just comparing my internal with my internal measurement system, pleasure versus pain, and then I'm choosing whatever I think pleasure is, I'll do that, and whatever I think, I think pain is, I, I avoid that. And that's all I do. And then I ask, well, what's really governing your life? Your soul's not governing your life. What's governing your life really is pain. And your definition of it and your avoidance of it. That's all that's governing your life. And that's what we end up with in the end. If we come down to me, well, I'm already five minutes over many though. If we go to Nat, do you want to ask? Go to Nat, just there behind him. Sure. I was just before you rub that out. Mm -hmm. Is I, I can see that happening with my well, God slash my daughter Jade. Um, this fictitious emotion, I get angry. I'm avoiding my pain. Is this how generational injury occurs? We just start hurting each other the more we avoid. Of course, pain. we avoid the pain and we create the fiction with whoever is around us. Yeah. If that happens to be our child, we dump it on our child. If that happens to be our husband, we dump it on our husband. If that happens to be our friend, we dump it on our friend. If that happens to be someone on the opposite side of the world and we've got the opportunity to harm them, we do. Like, it's sad, really, but that's what we do because, or because we're so addicted to avoiding what we believe is painful, we'll do anything. We're, we're like automations of our pain. Right? This is what I said to you yesterday, we need to get to the point where we're prepared to feel pain, where we want to feel our own pain rather than create pain for others. We need to get to that point. And that is a choice, that, that is a soul-based decision that needs to happen. Now, many of us don't have faith in that decision, and many of us don't believe that's even a truthful thing to do, or a good thing to do, and this is something we have to adjust we have to receive some of God's truth about that so that we get to think that, no, this is actually a good thing that I'm trying to do here rather than something that causes pain. The, the true cause of pain is the creation of further fictions which we then impose on everybody, including ourselves, around us. And then we wonder why the next generation is full of pain. And it's, it's because we didn't want to feel ours. And so what happens is we then... Unfortunately, we then, the whole of the next generation is now having to feel ours because we chose to not feel it. Right. So this is a very important part of your processing through emotion. Now, I haven't got to actually talk about what I wanted to talk about with emotion, which is interesting. But you have the first session two, two weeks ago that you can go back to and have a listen to that conversation as well about emotion, which is what I would suggest that you actually do. Because it's very good that we had this conversation because I feel that in the end, we are allowing our fear of painful emotion. And by the way, remember, it is our own definition of what is painful, which varies from person to person. We allow our definition of painful emotion to dominate our emotional experience. 
by trying to select it. Like, and ironic, the irony is, is we can't even select it really. So what we do is we create a whole heap of fictional things and dump all of it on that in the expression of some of our emotion, which causes a whole other series of damage to all sorts of people, including the world itself. And it's because we're addicted to our personal concept of what is painful and what is pleasurable. And we need to get God's concept of what is painful and what is pleasurable. We need to do that. And like I said, there's many people in this life who engage their addictions. Many people with breast cancer would rather engage their addiction that causes the breast cancer than, than cure the cancer by avoiding their addiction. The same applies to bowel cancer. The same applies to you know, people who smoke versus, versus the physical injuries that occur to the body through that. The same applies, if you think about it, almost every one of our addictions. A lot of men would choose to do something as dangerous as possible in order to prove their manhood than they would to actually think, well, no, that's a pretty dangerous thing to do. I probably shouldn't do that. Just because of an addiction, in other words. We would, we, we, this is what we're like. We, we measure things based on what we believe is more painful or pleasurable. So if proving ourselves is pleasurable, then we prove ourselves and we don't care about even the subsequent results to our own body. We couldn't care less. We just go ahead and do it. Because to us, that the real pleasure comes from, I've proved myself. You, know, you look at sportsmen. How many sportsmen get badly injured for the rest of their life? Well, it must be a fairly high percentage have bad injuries that they carry through the rest of their lives. But... But the addiction to prove something is higher than the consideration of the physical body's safety. For most women, it's the opposite. The consideration of the physical body's safety is more important than anything else. And so what they do, generally, is they avoid proving anything like <laughs> when there is a necessity to prove something because it's an issue of love or truth. So many of you ladies, you know, You'll sleep with somebody who doesn't love you, and you know they don't love you, but you give them sex because you get something from them in return, right? You'll do things for these reasons. And this is what I'm saying. We need to look at our internal measuring system, our pain versus pleasure monitor. You've all got one. It's like an electronic sensor <laughs> inside of you that's instant feedback to your soul. My soul is going, well, it's actually in your soul, and it's going, this is painful, this is pleasurable, this is painful, this is pleasurable, this is painful, this is pleasurable. Tell my mind, don't do something about this painful one. I enjoy this pleasurable one. Take action on this pleasurable one. Avoid this painful one, and so forth. And while we continue to do that, we're going to be completely afraid of emotion because we're not able to feel all emotion. A person who can feel both pleasure and pain is no longer afraid of emotion. <coughs> Interesting, huh? The fact that we choose to not feel pain is an indication we're afraid of emotion. Yep. And on this path, you need to get to the point where you're not afraid of emotion. Which means... You need to get to the point where you're not afraid of pleasure or pain. Okay. You just choose to feel them and the decision point is shifted away from pleasure versus pain because remember that's your definition and it's shifted to God's definition of love and truth versus error and unloving. That's the decision point that's made and then you finish up making decisions. Is this loving or truthful? Or is it untruthful or unloving? That's it. That's your only consideration. You don't consider pain or pleasure because you know loving and truthful always results in the long term in more pleasure and happiness. And you know that error and unloving always results in any term with more pain and suffering. So you know that. So you don't even have to consider pain and suffering anymore or pleasure. All you need to do is decide soul-based decision. Is this 
Loving or unloving? Is this truthful or untruthful? That's it. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Simplifies your life greatly. But also it helps you address all these emotions, some of which will be completely out of harmony with love and some of which will be in harmony with love, actually, inside of yourself. But you don't know which one's which at this stage because the only monitoring system you have is what is causing me pain and what is causing me pleasure. That's the only monitoring system that you a bother to assess. All right. And while you do that, of course, unloving behaviour is certainly going to periodically result. All right. Sometimes you'll be loving and sometimes you'll be unloving. So that's an exercise of your will. Okay, well, we'll have a break for, uh, if we can make it 10 minutes, if we can come back at 25 past, is that alright with everyone? And uh, we'll get started on some Q&A on those subjects.